This is Dr. Howard Strassler presenting the e-lecture on Decision Making and Restorative Interventions, Module 3, Class 3, Anterior Proximal Caries, Defective Restorations, and Class 3, Preparation Design. When we look back upon what we've already learned about uh, all the different classifications of carious lesions and restorations, that a review of the class 3 is it's a smooth surface carious lesion on the proximal surfaces of anterior teeth. The progression of caries on the smooth surface is very broad. It's sitting below the contact area. The bacteria are attacking the enamel, penetrating the enamel, forming a triangle, a cone, where the tip of the cone reaches the DEJ and then spreads along the DEJ uh, and then the caries uh, follows the dentinal tubules towards the pulp. Uh, looking at a line drawing view you can see uh, how the classical view of class 3 caries uh, exists. Clinically it has many different views depending upon uh, how long the bacteria have been sitting on the tooth, the duration the longevity uh, of, uh, of the carious lesion itself. As we've talked about before, the carious lesion continuum is an equilibrium between remineralization and demineralization of the tooth. And that really the intervention to restore occurs when we see a cavitation on the surface and that the caries has penetrated the DEJ. Up to that point, enamel caries alone, without cavitation, can be remineralized. So let's talk about restorative interventions. When are we going to have an intervention to restore uh, a given tooth? Well, the primary reason would be a cavitation, the inability to remineralize, that the surface of the enamel has been de damaged, the surface of the dentin has been damaged where the caries extends past the DEJ, uh, where we see the presence of a defective restoration either due to a marginal gap, due to fracture of the restoration or fracture of the tooth, an anatomically incorrect proximal contact leading to periodontal problems, for a composite, unestatic poor color match. Marginal staining can lead to a restorative intervention for restoration replacement or restoration marginal polishing. The presence of recurrent caries can lead to an intervention, as can an overhanging composite resin margin. Now keep in mind, anterior teeth, uh, many don't have proximal contact. You know individuals have anterior spacing, have diastomas. Proximal contact is important for the class 2 restoration due to the forces of occlusion being along the long axis of the tooth uh, and during mastic mastication of food, food can be packed between the teeth if the anatomic location and contact is incorrect uh, or not present. This can lead to periodontal problems to include bone loss and periodontitis. So we're making a, a restorative intervention. That anatomic incorrect proximal contact, and as I said, uh, anterior teeth many times do not have proximal contact. In fact, one study demonstrated that anterior teeth uh, only have proximal contact uh, approximately 63% of the time. 37% of the time, anterior teeth are not in contact at all. We can see space between the teeth. When teeth have proximal contact, proximal contact should be restored. We're restoring proximal contact for aesthetic reasons. Patients who are dissatisfied with spacing, uh, with diastomas, we can restore proximal contact uh, with anatomically correct contours. This is elective by the patient. In fact, uh, in many cases, the first recommendation for patients unhappy with spacing, uh, if the spacing is large enough, is to have orthodontic treatment and then retaining the teeth once they're moved in the new uh, aligned position. Let's take a look at the 
clinical appearance of class 3 caries. On the left hand side we can see a radiographic view with a periapical, a PA, of the maxillary lateral incisor number 10 and that we can see a slight shadowing and a slight difference in the appearance uh, at the enamel and to the DEJ. Clinically, by shining a bright light through the tooth, we can see the shadowing that demonstrates this interproximal carious lesion from both a lingual view on the top right hand side and a facial view on the bottom right hand side. And we're using a bright light. We can use a dental curing light in the clinic, running it not at full power but at three or four on its power guide. Or we can try using a high speed handpiece, uh, an electric handpiece with a fiber optic tip and we can control the amount of light uh, through the uh, console. And the shadowing of the tooth many times as we can see on this left hand side uh, demonstrates the caries is past the DEJ. Radiographically when we look at the uh, tooth number 10 we can barely notice any sense of carious lesion. But when we look at number 11 on the mesial surface we can see the caries is readily apparent and in fact if we compare the radiographic view to the clinical view that we need both uh, views in order to help make our definitive diagnosis. That the radiographic uh, appearance of class 3 caries can be very subtle and not as visually evident, even with transillumination. And so we're confirming caries both radiographically and clinically. Uh, sometimes we see a defective co composite restoration. In this case, there's a gap between the composite and the cava surface margin, a defective margin, and we're going to replace that composite. We're going to remove the entire composite restoration. In fact, you can see on the lower right hand side that upon removal of the composite, uh, we're in fact extending the cavity preparation outline. So how do we make decisions to uh, have a restorative intervention for a class 3 proximal lesion of the anterior teeth? Well, when we talk about uh, proximal pathology in anterior teeth, we're referring to three distinct uh, areas. The first would be that we see the lesion radiographically. It's in the enamel only and is not visible clinically. As the caries progresses, the lesion becomes cavitated. We can actually take an explorer and drop into a hole in the tooth. Uh, if a tooth has been previously restored, nothing lasts forever, a composite can eventually become defective, either due to marginal gaps, uh, discoloration, uh, fracture of the restoration, loss of retention of the restoration. Uh, all of these can lead to need for replacement. And our interventions are based upon the degree of pathology. When the caries is in the, in the enamel only, without cavitation, we can reevaluate and use preventive treatment, typically fluorides. When the lesion becomes cavitated or there's a presence of a dis defective restoration, we need to restore. For anterior teeth, typically we're using tooth colored composite resins. Uh, there are times when you can use a metallic restoration and the distal of a maxillary canine or a mandibular canine is typically not in the aesthetic zone and that we can use an amalgam. Uh, in today's practice of dentistry with the quality of the composites we have in their physical properties, uh, the majority of class threes, even to the distal of a maxillary mandibular canine are done with composite resin. So we're making our decision making. Uh, the radiographic appearance of the lesion and here we're looking at two views of tooth number 10 on the mesial surface and its radiographic appearance. Uh, is it visible? Is it invasive to greater than one half the thickness of enamel? Is it uh, enamel caries where the enamel surface is intact? Uh, is there dentinal caries with the enamel surface intact? And that could be remineralized. Or is it 
dentinal caries with enamel cavitation, in which case we're going to have an intervention to restore the tooth. And so our decision making for a class 3 to restore with proximal caries is based upon both clinical and radiographic views. Unlike the class 2 lesion, which is typically diagnosed radiographically only, the class 3 is many times diagnosed clinically because the thickness of enamel allows us to view and to illuminate the tooth to see the extent of the lesion. Radiographically, we'll see that change in density within the enamel and into the, DE, into the dentin past the DEJ. We may many times see composite resin restorations on radiographs. They can either be radiopaque, where they're hybrid or nanohybrid composites, or they might be radiolucent, uh, generally microfill composites, or composites that are older that are using a radiolucent filler. Typically, that radiolucent filler is quartz. And this idea of radiolucency in the composite means that we have to verify the presence or absence of a restoration clinically. We can't diagnose only by looking at a radiograph uh, for class 3s. So we take a look at some clinical views. Here we're looking at two class 3 lesions on the mesial of the maxillary central incisors. In tooth number 8, <coughs> there's a composite resin that's slightly radiopaque. In tooth number 9, we can see some shadowing that demonstrates some level of caries in this tooth. And that clinically, when we look, we can see the nano composite in tooth number 8. And number 9 has a mesial-lingual carious lesion. And we can see the shadowing beneath the enamel surface. And so our decision making is made not just by radiographic appearance, but that radiographically caries looks very radiolucent because nothing's there. It's a hole in the tooth. That caries, depending upon how much enamel is remaining, may be uh, dark and black, uh, meaning that there's nothing present, or there may be a thin enamel wall that gives us this translucent appearance. There are times where there'll be the presence of a composite resin restoration, and we'll see radiolucencies adjacent to the margin. In this case, we're looking at recurrent caries when compared to uh, initial caries. But we're always confirming its appearance with the clinical appearance of the teeth. There are times that the composite and caries may give a very similar appearance. Here we see caries uh, in a class 3 situation that's through and through. Uh, when we take a look at uh, tooth number 7, uh, we notice that tooth number 7 has a radiolucency underneath the composite. That may either be recurrent decay, it may be a gap caused by the adhesive light curing and being very thick, or it could be a radiolucent liner. Uh, in the case of tooth number 9 on the mesial surface, it looks like there may be caries there. In fact, clinically, we noted that there was a microfill composite resin, highly polishable composite, using silicon dioxide as its filler, which is radiolucent. We compare this to nanohybrid composites, which are radiopaque and many times more radiopaque than uh, dentin and enamel, but less radiopaque than amalgam. And so we're looking at different circumstances, the presence of composite resin versus caries uh, in the teeth. Uh, radiographically, we see there's uh, a sense of a, com uh, a carious lesion on the mesial of tooth number uh, 10. We can look at it clinically as we make our initial entry into the tooth and see some shadowing. In fact, the clinical appearance uh, can be discolored with absolutely no cavitation, where the depth is within the enamel, and we can see that there's an enamel lesion on the mesial surface of the mandibular incisor. It's non-cavitated, but we can see that that thin enamel has been penetrated, and it moves into the dentin. Uh, clinically cavitated areas, which are verified with the Explorer, confirmed with transillumination and with radiographs, 
uh, make it an easier decision to make as to how to intervene. And so we take a look at these very classical image of the penetration and extension of class 3 caries. Now, we're going to make decisions as to intervene based upon whether a restoration is acceptable or defective. Uh, to our right, we can see a class 4 composite resin that's been placed and replaced three times previously. Uh, when we take a look at this fractured composite, we can see that the occlusion was contributing to the composite fracture and needed to be taken into account. That typically, when we're replacing class 3s, we're replacing them due to the fact that they may be under-contoured. They may be worn uh, and need to be replaced. We look for marginal staining and ditching as reasons for replacement, or fractures within the restoration as reasons for replacement. We'll sometimes notice caries. It may be recurrent decay, as we see around uh, uh, the restoration on the distal of number 9. It could be wear and fracture, which is what we see in the composite on the mesial of number 9 and the mesial incisal of number 8. We may replace composite for aesthetic reasons where the patient's unhappy with the color, the contour, the shape, or we'll make our designation for replacement based upon radiographic appearance of recurrent decay or initial caries uh, around that restoration. And so the reasons for composite resin replacement are several. It may be due to a marginal void, especially in the gingival third, that cannot be repaired. It may be due to inadequate anatomic form, or gingival overhang. There may be a discrepancy uh, between the tooth in contact and shape and overhang that may contribute to periodontal pathology. There will be times we'll see recurrent uh, caries that extends beyond the margins and within the dentin, and we'll see shadowing within the tooth. We compare that to discolored margins and marginal staining that may only be at the surface and may in fact be underneath the restoration as the restoration may be extending extended on unetched enamel. We may decide to replace a restoration because the patient's unhappy with the aesthetics as it relates to color. This discolored restoration can be replaced in whole or if the restoration is sound we can resurface that restoration with composite and have a chemical adhesion between the two resin restorations. Sometimes we see fracture of the tooth, fracture of the composite itself. And then wear we, and the loss of occlusal function, uh, protective function in excursions would be a reason why we might replace a composite restoration. So here we're looking at some changes and reasons for replacement. Uh, in this case, we can see in tooth number 10 on the mesial surface, we have a discolored composite. We see a discolored composite also on the mesial facial of tooth number 11. We might see recurrent caries in a marginal area, as we see on tooth number, uh, tooth number 9. Now, keep in mind for this class 4 that aesthetically, uh, the patient may notice that number 9 is wider than number 8. If we were going to restore number 9 to be a mirror image of number 8, we need to take out this composite, measure the distance from the distal of number 8 to the distal of number 9, divide it by 2, and then create a width for number 9 that follows that formula of one-half the distance between the two distal surfaces. And then we'd add composite on the mesial facial and mesial lingual of tooth number 8 so that we have two teeth that have proportional widths. Our class 3 preparation design can either be with a facial or a lingual approach. And when we go over restorations and preparations for class 3s, uh, you'll see examples of uh, different approaches in order to restore these teeth.
Our instrumentation is typically done either with a 330 burr or with a 35 inverted cone burr. The 35 inverted cone burr gives us a nice flat smooth facial wall uh, when we're using a lingual approach. Uh, it's not as long as the 330 which means if we're near the gingival interproximal papilla that we're not going to be worried about nicking that papilla or nicking the dental dam. The preparation design whenever possible is to use a lingual approach to maintain facial aesthetics, facial enamel for aesthetics. The outline is going to be determined by the extent it carries uh, and the removal of any existing defective restoration. But typically it's a lingual approach to maintain the aesthetic facial wall of enamel. That our preparation design for our margins in stress sparing areas we want no bevel at all. We want a right hand angle margin. But in non stress bearing areas, as you can see from this facial approach for a class 3 and a maxillary incisor, we can bevel the facial enamel to give us an aesthetic blend of composite, uh, as well as the chance to get better adhesion and less micro leakage and less marginal staining. Uh, if our class 3 margin ends on the root surface and there's no enamel, we're going to treat the root surface with a right angle margin with no bevel. This is a consistent thing that we're going to do whether it be a class 5, a class 3, uh, or a class 4 in terms of how we handle margins in non-stress bearing areas. Our preparation designed for a class 3 with amalgam is typically used on the distal surface of a canine uh, where aesthetics is not critical. And you can see on the right hand side an example of a class 3 amalgam that was placed previously that's on the distal holding the proximal contact and the enamel surface is intact on the facial. Our cavo surface margin designs are at right angles at 90 degrees as they would be for an amalgam preparation on an occlusal or a class 5 amalgam uh, preparation. Amalgam is typically used uh, when we're using it in the anterior on the canine. So when it comes to making our decisions for class 3's and here we're looking at a class 3 carious lesion on the distal of a maxillary right central incisor. Radiographically it's through the enamel into the dentin. We can see from a clinical view uh, that uh, the enamel uh, is demineralized and after our tooth preparation our lingual margins are at right angles. Our facial margins are slightly beveled. Good diagnosis and treatment planning requires a complete evaluation using all the diagnostic tests necessary to make an adequate decision. You've been listening to and watching Decision Making and Restorative Interventions, Module A on Class 3 Anterior Proximal Caries, and Defective Restorations and Class 3 Preparation Design.